Good evening, good evening, good evening to uh, one and all. I think we've got uh, a few participants that are joining us. We've just opened the uh, Zoom window. So let us give ourselves a minute or so, and then we'll get started. I see the number of participants are picking up slowly. That's great. Ah, I notice, uh, I recognize some of the names of the participants. Uh, welcome to the students. Thank you for joining us, guys. I know you've got no access to voice and video at this stage. Um, but I think you may have access to a thumbs up, or maybe you just want to give us a thumbs up or a wave. There we go. I see a hand up. <laughs> Can you see your hands up? Okay, somebody's uh, somebody's in the house. Welcome, uh, Mabuse. All right, it's uh, 1900 on the clock. I'm going to give it exactly another minute, and we'll start at 1901-ish. Uh, because we've, th this is a really a good session, and we want to maximize on the time available to us. All right, my watch says 1901. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening. My name is Hussein Esof, and I'm based in Johannesburg. And as you can see, it is wonderfully warm and uh, very bright in Johannesburg, uh, despite the sun going down, the snow coming down, and the load shedding. Uh, but I think the evening and the opportunity for this evening, uh, for especially uh, the students uh, of Regent and as part of the honors group, uh, it's a fantastic opportunity for you to be able to enter a competition uh, that closes next week, Friday, on the 21st. Uh, but the competition would potentially entitle you to, um, to, to win a prize for a trip to Harvard. What a wonderful opportunity that is. Uh, my guest this evening and our main presenter is Mr. Nazir Jamal. Uh, Nazir, you know, just wave at us there on your side, Nazir. Everyone. That's Nazir Jamal yeah. there. Uh, he's based in Durban, and I know it's bitterly cold in Durban. They had uh, uh, a southwester blowing, or is that Cape Town? I can't remember. Nazir, how's the weather in uh, Cape in Durban? Well, well, I was in Cape Town this morning. I just landed now in Durban, so I missed uh, all the <laughs> all the drama. Okay, so a quick introduction to Nazir. Nazir Jamal is a professional environmental assessment scientist with a BSc in econo Economics, Geography, and Environmental Management, and has an Honours in Environmental Science. He has 11 years of experience in government, engaging with environment, legal compliance, monitoring, and enforcement, waste and pollution management, and environmental impact assessment, and climate change policy. He has an active EMI, Nazir, I suppose that means an environmental impact what is EMI? Environmental Nazir? Management Inspector. Yeah. Uh -huh. he, has a, he, has a, he was an active EMI for the Green Scorpion since 2010. He's employed for all uh, three spheres of government, including National Department of Water and Sanitation, then the National uh, Department of Environmental Affairs, the KZN Department of Economic uh, Development, Tourism and Environmental Affairs, and the Atequini Municipality. He's been active in the NGO sector, and that's where I actually know Nazir from, when he was much, much younger and without a beard, uh, for over 15 years. And he's currently the chairperson of a, uh, a famously active NGO based in, well, throughout the country and globally, if I'm not mistaken, called Penny Appeal South Africa. Uh, and they're an international uh, nonprofit, but they do wonderful work in South Africa as well. Uh, Nazir was awarded one of the 200 top young South Africans by the Mail and Guardian as climate reality leader by Climate Reality Council member of the KZN Climate Change and Sustainability Development Council and board member of the International Association of Impact Assessment, KZN branch. Nazir, that's a mouthful. I hope you don't give us so many um, uh, uh, acronyms and descriptions of other things as we go along, but we look yeah. forward to your, to your, uh, to, to your presentation. Uh, on the SDGs, uh, just remember that you're getting a you're getting a share in the prize. I don't know what that means. 
<laughs> Whoever is the winner, when they go to Harvard, they'll bring you a bottle of water. Oh, uh, and if you're in Johannesburg right now, a bottle of water is worth gold. Because yeah. we have this 48-hour, almost 72-hour water shedding of some sort. Oh, so my we gosh. will pay a bucket of gold for a bucket of water. Let's hope it's not in a plastic bottle, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I leave it in your good hands. I'm going to go off camera so they focus only on your handsome face and not mine. And then Wonderful. towards the end, when we come to Q&A and uh, when I start doing the business model canvas, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll reconnect. Thank you, Nasir. Thank you so much. I'm just going to try and share my screen here. And uh, I'm sure everyone can see that now. Well, thank you. Good evening to all the students and uh, guests that have joined us. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of my uh, experience in the environmental field and as well as in the, the community space um, and community development space. And thanks to Region Business School and Honoris uh, for this opportunity to, to let's work together and find solutions to the major issues that we face as a human race. And just to start off the... You know, the, the, when the concept came up and, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about young people um, because I was once a young person. I'm getting old and gray now. Uh, the idea was that I came up was I needed something that was invigorating. And that's the word that came up to me. But I said, I don't know how to use invigorating in the concept. So we came up with the, the name igniting innovation for sustainable development goals. So hopefully that's kind of a, a feel of how this presentation will go. I want it to become uh, something that invigorates you, it, it ignites something in you, and hopefully that that something is innovation and that's a different type of thinking in this um, very strange world that we live in, but a world that if we all can work together and if we all put our heads together and if we all share and, and realize that we all share the same values, we share the same reality of survival, then we can have a world that is better. And so that is pretty much sums up what we're going to be talking about today. So just to, let's try and move on here. Okay, there we go. So the agenda is very short, uh, but it's going to be, I know, just over one and a half hours that we have together. Um, we'll start off with discussing the sustainable development goals. We'll talk about two case studies uh, that I've, I've just dra drafted up and we can just go and explain how uh, to, to generally look at how your mind can start developing and understanding how to use the SDGs in uh, creating solutions and, in, and possibly innovative solutions. And then uh, the business model con canvas will be discussed a, a little. And finally, we'll have some engagement. So that's pretty much how the session will go. Um, and I'm going to actually start right now. So let's get into the history of sustainable development. And this is quite an interesting history. Uh, you know, for centuries, generations, people, uh, humankind would meet at different places. And if it, it happened in a tribal sense, the tribal leaders will meet. If it happened in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a national sense, the country ministers will meet. If it happened on a global scale, you'll have country pre uh, presidents and, you know, uh, heads of states uh, meeting and convening, trying to resolve an issue that either it's in a tribal sense or it's in a global sense or a local sense. And these conferences that happen sometimes can be talk shops, but at, at some moment, there's always something that comes from it. And this is a great history that you can explain how through discussions and conferences and meetings that we led to this thing called the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm going to go quickly through this. In 1972, there was a conference called the United Nations Conference on Human Environment. It was linked at that time to economic growth, environmental issues, and social issues. And at that point, there was a lot of the thought process was around them being separate to each other. But when in 1987, the Brundtland Report came out, Our Common Future, it for the first time linked economic growth with environmental protection and social uh, investment. It was the first time that a definition of the word, this buzzword, sustainable development or sustainability came up. And the idea was that the Brundtland Report focused on the common future that we all have as human beings together. But it's not just us as humankind. It's the fact that we live in a world called the environment. And that environment is related to everything around us, the air we breathe, the animals that we associate with, the plants that we consume, the plants that the animals consume that we consume thereafter. All of this is, is this entire ecosystem has to evolve together. 
And if we want economic growth, we cannot have economic growth with environmental degradation. We cannot have environmental protection without economic growth. At the same time, we can't have social protection. We can't have social investment without having us ensuring that there's economic growth and that there's environmental protection. And so these three factors came together, and I'll talk a little bit about them later on. But for the first time, we had a definition of this sustainable development word, and they said that they felt the sustainable development was meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, the reality was that we're realizing industrialization came and people were just spending money and developing and not considering the other. It was in something in the environmental term we called NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y, not in my backyard. If it's not happening in my backyard, I don't really care. This is kind of the concept that we realized people, humankind was, was living. So if it's happening across the road, uh, um, it's a fire there. I'm not going to call the fire department. I don't want to get involved. Nothing to do with me. And this is a really incorrect way of living. Because if you looked at the initial how we all humankind existed, we helped each other. It was community. It was if you've got a problem, I've got a problem. We need to work together. Let's resolve it. And this kind of is where this term sustainable development came in. And so they integrated those three aspects, as I mentioned. Then in 1992, there was a conference called the Earth Summit. They came up with 20, 27 principles of sustainable development. They endorsed a few more new types of principles on, on, on forest deforestation. Uh, then there was further conventions on biological diversity. And a lot of these new buzzwords that we now talk about every day uh, were designed at these conferences. And Agenda 21 came up, which was a voluntary plan of action that all the countries of the United Nations decided to implement in a national, regional, and local scale. And you can read much more about it. I've got a link here, which you can then uh, click in and read much more about that. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into that. But then in 2000, there was a, a word called the Millennium Development Goals. And this was, again, you know, Y2K, and people were scared, like the world's going to end, and, you know, there was major controversies. But what was interesting was they... From the 27 principles of sustainable development, eight international development goals were designed. However, these goals were very limited. They focused more on human issues, very little on environmental. And so there was obviously scope for, for, for developing these further. And that's when we came in 2002, South Africa came, came up on the map. We had the World Summit on Sustainable Development here in Johannesburg. And this renewed the international commitments of all the countries of the United Nations. And they, the, they pursued this sustainable development concept and they came up with the JPOI, which is the Johannesburg Plan of Implementation. And that led to 2012 Rio plus 20, the future we want. And that is where the SDGs were developed. The 100, I think it was 193 countries. I mean, you can't even get two countries to agree on issues and we're not going to go down that, that road. But 193 countries agreed on the 17 sustainable development goals that we have today. And uh, they, uh, they agreed on all of the previous agreements, uh, Agenda 21, JPOI, and, and it was really something to, to, to hear about and will be written in the books to come. And this is where we get this word sustainable development from, sustainability and the idea of the, the SDGs. So again, the definition that I spoke about was meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. And it, and it basically has those two aspects, the, the concept of needs. So in particular, the essential needs of the world's poor to, to which, oh, which themselves uh, have issues of overriding priority. And then the idea of limitations, imposing the tech, uh, the, by the state of technology and social organization on environmental ability to meet their present needs. So these are the two aspects that we kind of mentioned. And that idea of combining economic growth with social justice and environmental protection. Again, these were buzzwords. No one knew how it was going to be implemented. And this is where each country had to go back and realize how they were, were going to do it. But this is something I want to share. This is statistics. I think the latest one I got was about 2021, 2022. And these are shocking statistics. And this shows the reason, the importance, and the value that SDGs have in our daily lives uh, as people, as companies, as businesses, as countries, and as nations. Look at, look at poverty. According to the World Bank in 2019, about 9.2% of the world's population 
approximately 689 million people lived in extreme poverty. Uh, and this is divided, some define it as one uh, less than $1 a day, some $1.9. There's a few strategies there. Hunger. The Food and Agriculture Organization reported that in 2020, an estimated 811 million people worldwide um, were suffering with chronic undernourishment. Hunger and malnutrition are complex issues affected by factors of conflict, climate change, and economy. And then let's look at the environment. Climate change, according to, to the IPCC, that global greenhouse gas emissions have been increasingly, steadily uh, rising temperatures, sea level rise, extreme weather patterns. We're seeing that now here in South Africa, often uh, with the extreme rains in Cape Town and Durban, uh, snow in Johannesburg. These are extreme weather patterns and events that cannot be easily explained through science, but can only be explained through potentially climate change and, 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 and rising temperatures in certain areas. Biodiversity loss, uh, risk of extinction of over 1 million species, water scarcity, uh, uh, approximately 2.2 billion people worldwide lack access to safe water, drinking water. Around 4.2 billion people lack access to adequate sanitation facilities. I mean, these are numbers, but these are realities. I mean, I work in the, in the charity sector as well, and I go to parts of Africa and the Middle East, and I see the reality of people where, where we just open up a tap and have safe drinking water, fairly safe drinking water. And the reality is that billions, I'm not saying millions, I'm saying billions of people around the world don't have access. And, you know, you can talk about the whole issue of the developed world and the developing world and the responsibility of the developed world to help the developing world, but also the importance of the developing world to become resilient themselves and to, you know, find solutions within themselves. Um, and, and the solutions are there, definitely. So this leads to the principles of sustainable development. And the five Ps is what we mentioned, right? We talk about is people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. You'll see these five Ps in nearly all of the SDGs that we're going to be discussing. And you will then appreciate the importance of the five Ps, the people that we need to be responsible as people. The planet is what we need to protect uh, as vice students. Uh, prosperity is is economic growth, peace, and 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 uh, in the lands that we have are neighboring with, and others that we are engaged with, and obviously partnerships. How valuable these partnerships can be through um, through developing uh, a, a better future for us all. And there's a whole lot of concepts. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but basically, uh, living within environmental limits. We can't just be clearing the Amazon jungle because we need to have more land for for farming. Uh, practices without realizing the value that the Amazon jungle has to our own survival uh, as a human race. At the same time, we need to integrate our decision making. We need to have good governance, transparency. We need to be responsible use of our, our of resources, uh, credible scientific evidence. And there's three very interesting policies in terms of environmental that I love to talk about. Um, I've actually done uh, a, a, a half day presentation on just these three. Uh, policies. So I can talk a lot about them, but I'm just going to quickly go through them. One is, for example, the precautionary principle that, you know, human activities should choose always to the, the side of caution rather than, or, or rather than the side of saying, let's go into a heavy risk opportunity. So find the science behind it. If the science says, take it slow, let's take it slow. That's kind of one of the, uh, the principles. The other is the polluter pays principle. If you are the, the person who is generating waste, then you are the one and that is responsible to ensure that pollution is not occurring. And if pollution does occur, even by a third party, right? So for example, the, 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 which relates to the next concept of cradle to grave, if there's a, a bottle, so say you're a, a, you're a, we're gonna talk about later about a soap company. So if you own a soap company and you create packaging that you're, you're, it's made of um, uh, plastic, and you as a, as a responsible uh, uh, manufacturer, also have the responsibility to think of how is that third user, the, the purchaser of this product going to do? What are they going to do with this plastic after that? Can they throw it away? If they do throw it away, is it going to be recycled? Uh, can it be recycled? Can I use better uh, materials? Can I change the material rather than plastic? Should I use paper, maybe biodegradable paper? Those are the concepts that we talk about when it comes to polluter praise principle and also cradle to grave principle, meaning from the time that the product is designed from raw material right until it gets disposed of, that circular economy, as we, we, we always mention uh, about, is about bringing back that reality that this, there's this process, there's 
potential risks, environmental, social, economic risks that are involved. And at the end of that, how can then we bring that back? How can we reduce our impact? How can we improve the lives of our customers, of our clients, of, the, of our neighbors, of our communities? And then obviously, how do we ensure uh, the best form of economic growth? Um, this is one slide, I'm not gonna go too much in detail, but I just want you to realize that there are certain planetary boundaries that we, are, that we exist within. And I highlighted four of those in red. Right, there's nine planetary boundaries. I've highlighted only four of those. And those four are really interesting because out of the nine planetary boundaries that exist, already four of those are in trouble. Already four of those are showing signs of degradation, showing signs of major loss. For example, we have climate change. We're seeing huge changes in biodiversity losses species extinction, right here in South Africa, we're losing species um, at a great rate. There's a species of grass called the KZN sandstone sauerfeld. It's highly protected species of grassland that we have. And we only have a few, I think over a few acres of it left in the entire of KZN, for example. So this is the reality around the world. And already four of these planetary boundaries are being destroyed. And what is next is the question. So this leads me to the sustainable development goals as we are going to be talking much more about them today. Um, so the Sustainable Development Goals are a set of global objectives established by the United Nations in 2015 to address the pressing global challenges and obviously to promote sustainable development. So many countries have integrated the SDGs into their national development plans. South Africa is one of them. Um, they're aligning their policies and resources accordingly. Um, I've just done some work now with the Road Traffic Management Corporation here in South Africa, and uh, they've now uh, assessed their risks in terms of, uh, of, the, of sustainability, um, looking at their social, environmental, and economic risks. And then they included the SDGs as part of one of their major uh, initiatives, and they've now designed solutions to ensure that they are covering at least, I think they've done about seven or eight of these SDGs. Um, within their practices. So, um, yeah, the history, as we spoke about in terms of SDGs and the interdependence of the social, economic, and environmental aspects. And so there's 17 of these, and we're going to go into each one now. So this is how it looks. Take a, take a few moments while I just grab something to drink <laughs> to read that. Uh, familiarize yourself with it. And we're going to go through each one of them as we, as we move across. Okay, so I think we can move on. So let's start with the first one. I mean, I get very scared <laughs> when people say no poverty. I mean, we live in a world where um, the reality is that they are rich, they're super rich, there's middle class, there's low class, and then there's those who are completely destitute. And that's the reality of it. So I think, imagine a world with no poverty. And, and you would think yeah, that's possible. I mean, that's impossible. But look, this is a goal that we achieve, want to achieve. And we want to achieve it because if you look at it from a local perspective, you and your family, in your entire family, you want no one to suffer from poverty. Then let's look at it from your neighbors. You don't want your neighbors to suffer. From a community, you don't want them to suffer as well. And then from, the, from, from your country, you want your country to be prosperous. So if you look at it that way, there is potential if we work together to have no poverty. Right. So I've highlighted some of the targets as we go through. I'm not going to mention all of them. There's too many to go through. So I've just highlighted some of the green, the ones in green are the ones that I think that are quite important to potentially what we were discussing today. So I'll just go zip through some of them. Uh, and you can read this obviously in your own time. Um, and this is all available online. I've got resources that I'll share. So for example, no poverty. One of the targets is by 2030, which is only in a few years time. Um, and COVID came in and, and disrupted the time frame. So I'm sure there's going to be an extension of time frame for this. So 2030 leaves us with about what six or seven years to eradicate extreme poverty for all people everywhere, currently measured as people living on less than 1.25 a day uh, in terms of dollars. Uh, 1.4 says by 2030, ensure that all men 
and women in particular, the poor and the vulnerable have equal rights to economic resources, as well as access to basic services, ownership and control over land and other forms of property, inheritance, natural resources, appropriate new technology and financial services, including microfinance. Uh, target 1.5 says by 2030, build the resilience of the poor and those in vulnerable situations and reduce the exposure and vulnerability to climate re related extreme events and other economic, social and environmental shocks and disasters. So this is some of the targets with regards to no poverty. We talk about zero hunger. Uh, again, there's plenty of targets. By 2030, end hunger and ensure all access by all people, in particular the poor and the poor people in vulnerable situations, including infants, to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food all year round. By 2030, end all forms of malnutrition, including achieving by 2025 the internationally agreed targets on stunting and wasting in children under five years of age, and address the nutritional needs of adolescent girls, pregnant and lactating women, and older persons. Uh, double the agricultural productivity of and incomes of small scale food producers, in particular women, indigenous people, family farmers, pastoralists and fishers, in, uh, and including through secure and equal access to land, other productive resources, inputs, knowledge, financial services, markets and opportunities for value addition and non-farm employment. <coughs> By 2030, ensure sustainable food production systems and implement resilient agricultural activities that increase productive, productivity and production that help maintain ecosystems that strengthen capacity for adaption to climate change, extreme weather, drought, flooding, and other disasters that progressively improve land and soil quality. The third one is good health and well being. So, again, target by 2030 to reduce global maternity mortality um, ratio. By 2030, preventable deaths of newborns, children under five years of age. Um, by 2030, to uh, end the epidemic of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases. Um, ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health services uh, for family planning and education. Achieve universal health care or health coverage, rather, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health care services, and so on. So that's with regards to good health and um, wellness. Quality education by 2030 ensure that all girls and boys complete free, equitable, and quality primary and secondary education. Uh, ensure all girls and boys have access to quality early childhood development, uh, pre primary education. Uh, men and women have affordable, uh, quality, technical, vocational, and tertiary education. Um, also, a substantial increase in the number of youth and adults who have relevant skills including technical and vocational skills for employment, decent jobs, and entrepreneurship. And that you know, list goes on with regards to quality education. We then talk about gender equality. Um, here, end all forms of discrimination against all women and uh, girls everywhere. Eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls in public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. Eliminate all harmful practices such as child and early and forced marriage and female genital mutilation. And ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in political, economic, and public life. So that is gender equality. The sixth goal is clean water and sanitation. By 2030, achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all, uh, to achieve access to adequate and equitable sanitation and hygiene for all, especially those women and girls in vulnerable situations, improve for those, for example, in refugee camps and so on, improve water quality by reducing pollution, eliminating, eliminating dumping and minimizing release of hazardous chemicals and materials, halving the proportion of untreated wastewater and substantially increasing recycling and safe re reuse globally. So this is regards to clean water and sanitation. Um, and there's a whole lot more that, that they discuss in this, in this regard. But as, you, as you're reading through, are you noticing that a lot of them have interconnectedness? Um, and that's important. We'll discuss a little later on. But I mean... <coughs> The reality is that a lot of them do have interconnect. They actually overlap each other. And that's beautiful because you could be working on, uh, for example, this one, affordable and clean energy, and you could be then using um, a, a solution 
for better and clean energy, especially like in South Africa, we have issues of energy, but that you can relate to, you know, re resolving the, the, the issue of poverty by providing education. So already three SDGs are mentioned in just understanding clean energy, for example. So you're gonna provide, plus you assisting women, uh, providing them skills in the issue of, for example, the, uh, manufacturing solar panels. Um, so these are so one example I'm giving of trying to resolve one solution, one problem, but the solution lies in using all of the SDGs or many or a few of the SDGs to, to, to get to that solution. So kind of think about that as I'm going through uh, the, these sessions. So uh, in terms of clean energy by 2030, ensure universal access to affordable and reliable and modern energy. By 2030, increase substantially the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. By 2030, enhance international cooperation to facilitate access to clean energy, research and technology, including renewable energy, energy efficiency, and advanced cleaner fossil fuel technology, and so on. So quite high goals <laughs> for the next seven years. Um, here's the, an interesting one, decent work and economic growth. So for example, 8.2, achieve higher levels of economic productivity through diversification, technologically upgrading and innovation, including through focus on high value added and labor intensive sectors. Promote development of oriented policies that support productive activities, decent job creation, entrepreneurship, creativity, and innovation, and encourage the formalization and growth of micro, small, medium-sized enterprises, including access to financial services. Um, reduce the proportion of youth not in employment, education, or training, um, and achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men, including for young people and persons with disabilities, and equal pay for work of equal value. Uh, number nine, which is industry and innovation and infrastructure. This talks about to develop quality and reliable, sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Um, so we don't have failing uh, economies, especially in the developing world, like here in South Africa, where we're having fail, failing um, uh, issues with regards to our uh, energy crisis, um, because equipment is failing all the time. So having really reliable, strong, resilient infrastructure is critical and maintaining those uh, infrastructure, increasing the access of small scale industrial and other enterprises in developing countries to financially service uh, services, including affordable credit, um, upgrading infrastructure and retrofit industries to make them sustainable without increased resource use. So we don't lose industries that we are developed in this country already. Um, number 10 is reduced inequalities. So here we talk about the empowerment and promoting of social, economic, and political inclusion of all, irrespective of age, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, religion, or economic or any other status, improving the global financial markets, enhancing representation and voice for developing countries in decision-making in global international economic and financial institutions to, to deliver more effective, credible, and accountable legitimate institutions. So reducing those inequalities that we're facing around the world. Then building sustainable cities and communities uh, to ensure all uh, for all to adequate, safe and affordable housing and basic services to upgrade the slums, um, safe, affordable, accessible and sustainable transport systems uh, to expand the transport systems, uh, especially for those in vulnerable situations like women, children, persons, disabilities and others, strengthening efforts to protect and safeguard the world, cultural and natural heritage uh, resources, um, uh, you know, protecting our open green spaces um, and obviously making them much more easily accessible to women, children, and older persons and persons with disabilities. So that's sustainable cities and communities. Um, then you have responsible consumption and production. So, you know, implementing a 10 year framework of programs of sustainable consumption and production patterns, um, looking at achieving the sustainable management and efficiency of natural resources. Halve the capita global food waste at a retail and consumer level. This is very interesting. And reduce food losses along production and supply chains, including post-harvest losses. I and mean, when you go to the developed worlds and you see the amount of waste that is generated at, at, the, at the food courts uh, of the malls, 
uh, people it's just like in South Africa you don't you see waste like that but not at the extent that I see oh, um, in, in in the developed world because food is you know not a not it's not just a necessity it's a luxury for them right they can just buy food here today and walk to another shop and buy somewhere else so they just waste a lot of food and so they're trying to halve the per capita as per person global food waste uh, reduce waste generation through prevention uh, reduction, recycling, and reuse. This is the, the cycle that we talk about, of um, especially in the circular economy, to look at how we can firstly prevent waste from occurring, uh, whether you're a, yourself, whether you're a company, whether you're a country. Um, the second is to reduce it. So if you can't prevent creating that waste, then reduce the amount of waste that actually does need to be disposed of. And if you can't reduce, then at least try uh, recycle it um, or reuse that waste in a different form. And so that's where you the, the innovation of solutions and ideas come up, where people come up with some really from a small scale of someone taking a Coke bottle and cutting it half and making a shoe or, you know, uh, people make take tin cans and they make designs with it, bags with it and so on. So that's one form of reuse, recycling. Um, then, then you go on to a larger scale where, for example, tires from vehicles um, then there's ways of actually re generating major income from just the recycling of these tires by creating mats for soccer pitches, by um, using it to, to actually call py pyrolysis, which is the, uh, the, the re recycling of tires to create diesel from that, uh, from that rubber. So there's so many ways that we can, you know, use this in industries. And this is where young students like yourself can come up with some really interesting ideas on how we can we can use this SDG in terms of responsible consumption and production. Um, climate action. So this is 13, strengthening resilience and adaptive capacity to climate related hazards and natural disasters in all countries, integrating climate change measures into national policy strategies and planning, improving education and awareness, uh, raising and human and institutional capacity on climate change mitigation. And we're seeing this uh, is a lot um, in South Africa as well. I'm, I'm part of the, one of the committees here in KZN, and this is uh, top of the agenda, the new climate bill that's coming out in South Africa. Um, you know, hopefully that could be a great change in implementation. I'm always for implementation. I know we have just documents upon documents and plans and policies, but someday those policies need to be implemented. So this becomes a much more uh, rigid and implementable, uh, you know, paper rather than something that just sits in the office and we, you know, stick up on a wall to say we have. So climate realities is real. We're seeing areas that would normally have um, uh, no severe weather patterns are now having floods, areas that have floods are now having droughts. Uh, so we're seeing extreme weather, weather patterns. And so it is up to us as people, as communities, as countries, as businesses, as companies, manufacturers, to all consider how we can then find uh, uh, and build resilience and capacity to, to really uh, protect ourselves in terms of natural disasters. Then we look at life below the water, which is SDG 14, uh, which talks about the prevention and significant reduction of marine pollution of all kinds. Um, we see our, our South African coastlines here in KZN are tremendously affected by um, sewage, uh, by, by um, pollution incidents that occur in the rivers that end up in our marine environments. Um, and then you have the issue of overfishing and um, to regulate harvesting and overfishing, especially illegal fishing by trawlers that, that go up and down the coastlines. Um, 15, we're nearly there, life on land. Uh, this talks about conservation and restoration of sustainable use of our uh, freshwater ecosystems, uh, particularly our wetlands, our forests, and the protection of those uh, areas uh, of our mountain ranges. Um, also, the combating desertification by restoring degraded land. So, land that has been quarried now needs to be or mined now needs to be re-vegetated, um, and you know to to reduce the risks of droughts, uh, or rather of floods, flooding in areas, and so on. So, the, and the other one is also to reduce the amount of invasive alien species on land, um, and to control those and eradicate. Uh, those uh, priority species that spread across on our land. So this talks purely about biodiversity um, in itself. And then you have peace and justice, sorry, 16, 
and strong institutions. So this has significantly reduced all forms of violence and related death uh, uh, everywhere, end abuse, exploitation, faffing and all forms of violence against and torture, substantially reduce corruption and bribery, uh, develop effective, accountable and transparent institutions at all levels. And number 17, which is the last one, this is a bit of a longer one, but it talks about partnerships for the goals and the, and the strength in, 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 in achieving the SDGs is through partnerships. So strengthen domestic resource mobilization, including through international support for developing countries to improve domestic capacity for tax and other revenue collection. Um, in terms of technology, promoting the development, transfer, dissemination, and diffusion of environmentally sound um, technologies to developing countries on favorable terms, including on concessional and professional terms as mutually agreed. And capacity building, enhancing support for implementing an effective and targeting capacity building in developing countries to support national plans to implement all of the SDGs. Um, and then uh, in terms of trade, significantly increasing the exports of developing countries, in particular with a view to doubling the least developing countries to share global exports by 2020. And that's pretty much the uh, uh, you know issues with regards to the uh, SDGs and the 17. I think sorry, one more last page that talks about systematic issues. Um, I just look at 17.17. Encourage and promote effective public and public, private public partnerships and civil society partnerships, building on the experience and resourcing strategies at partnerships, data monitoring and accountability. So that pretty much gives you a background of. The SDGs in in somewhat of a detail that I could in the short time that I have, um, so hopefully that you know clarifies some of the uh, concerns that you may have on understanding SDGs and how they all work. I see I see Brother Hussein has his hand up there. Um, Nazir, firstly, thank you very much for that. I think that uh, that summary, uh, which most of the participants would have had access to prior, uh, was very useful. So it's a good useful reminder of you know a summary of of of, uh, of the seventeen. Uh, the next uh, the next session, if you wish, uh, also led by Nazir now, is one or two case studies. And we've asked Nazir to help us to put together one or two case studies to help you put together your own one for the competition. Uh, so, so the purpose of the next, I, I suppose, 45 minutes or so is to go through an example or two. Nazir, if you need more, no, no more time, not a problem. Uh, yeah. but, but the idea is to go through one or two case studies and to see how we can come up with a solution using the SDGs. And hopefully it will inspire you to start thinking similarly. So you can use these as examples when you're entering the competition that closes next week, th uh, next week, Friday, the 21st. Nazir, I'm back in your hands. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So I have uh, designed uh, two case studies and um, I was thinking about so many of them that I could have designed. And so I just wanted this as an example. Um, so I want you to think of yourself as a, um, you've got an opportunity to you know, come up with a, a company that create, that um, manufactures soap um, and, and soap itself, it's a chemical. And so think about that way and you seeing a great opportunity, potentially you can export to various markets from South Africa, but you want to enhance this production to be sustainable and you want to ensure that there's some social inclusivity in this operation. So the problem is, the statement is that you want to enhance, as I say, the production practices and ensure that there's uh, social inclusivity. So our soap manufacturing company recognizes the importance of aligning our operations with sustainable development goals to contribute to a healthier and more equitable world. We strive to optimize our production processes while minimizing environmental impacts and fostering social inclusivity. So that's pretty much the background. That is what we want to achieve. The question is, how do we get there? What innovative ways can we come up with to ensure that we achieve this? The first thing we need to do is find what SDGs would this in, in actually um, um, relate to and what SDGs then 
once we find that, we can actually find better solutions for that. So let's just go with this. One of the first things that I picked up, and I'm sure now you'll be able to understand better, is potentially gender equality. If you want to look at social inclusivity, you need to ensure that there's ways, looking at those targets that we saw earlier, there's ways that we find and we ensure that we have a good balance of genders working for um, uh, the company. And so when we start uh, applying our minds in terms of uh, looking for various um, responsible people who have the capabilities, uh, we ensure that we balance that equation. We, we include all uh, genders, uh, especially vulnerable uh, women uh, from areas, for example, that wouldn't be able to access the site and wouldn't would have to get opportunity to get a job in this company. Uh, we can then look at SDG 12, which talks about responsible consumption and production. So we look at ourselves and say, how can we be responsible in terms of our uh, raw material consumption, our uses of chemicals to make the soap, and then how, in, in terms of our production process, how can we then find uh, interesting ways, innovative ways to reduce our energy usage, to reduce our environmental uh, impact in terms of the packaging, in terms of our water use of how much of water we use in the facility. Potentially, we could, you know, have uh, ideas. Um, that would reduce our water consumption, our energy consumption. Um, and another one we could talk about is climate action. So looking at soap itself that enters, when someone uses soap, that waste that goes into the sewer then ends up at a sewer treatment plant. That sewer treatment plant then starts discharging this into the water course. What happens then if there's a pollution incident uh, and how does that impact um, downstream users of that river, for example? We then look at life below water, obviously, because this is water related. Um, we look at life on land. When the packages of that soap end up in the wrong places, they end up being littered on the roads. That affects uh, various species. It may end up in the ocean. How does that, those chemicals that we don't want to enter there, could that affect uh, our resources? So those are just a few that I picked up, for example. Sorry, let's just go back. Uh, of the SDGs. As I said, a lot of them relate to each other. This one specifically has a more of environmental slash social um, aspect to it. Um, again, I could add so many more to this. I could talk about job job employ, uh, um, creation, um, ensuring that you know people are provided with quality jobs, decent work, decent employment that we spoke about earlier. So again, you could come up with so many of these in terms of finding that solution. So we need to identify and, and implement these strategies that enable us to reduce our environmental footprint. So we must minimize the negative environmental impacts associated with our soap manufacturing process. As I spoke about resource consumption, waste generation, greenhouse gas emissions. And so that our goal is to adopt sustainable production practices that optimize resource efficiency and increase the use of renewable. And then we're going to promote gender equality and inclusive employment. We aim to foster a diverse and inclusive workforce with all different people of different backgrounds and genders. We need to address any existing gender disparities within the organization, promote equal access to employment, offer training for all those uh, career advancements, um, you know, to create a work environment that respects and values diversity uh, and equality in terms of one empowerment. So by addressing these challenges, our soap manufacturing company can contribute to the SDGs, making a positive impact on the environment and society as a whole. We seek innovative and practical solutions to align the SDGs while maintaining the high quality and affordable of our soap products. And that's important, right? Because of economic growth. So this may be a bit small to read, but um, I'm gonna try and show you some of the ideas that I came up with. Um, so we just looked at 12 and five. Uh, so we can firstly conduct a comprehensive sustainability assessment, evaluate the entire soap manufacturing process um, and uh, with the highest environmental impact, looking at all of the aspects of water consumption, waste management, raw, meat, raw material sourcing, etc. We can then adopt the renewable energy sources, transition to renewable energy, finding solar and wind power um, to minimize the reliance on fossil fuels. We can optimize our resource efficiency by reducing our water consumption, such as installing water efficient equipment, reusing recycling water in the process rather than adding new water all the time. Um, you know, so that's one example. Another one is to source sustainably, partner with suppliers or only choose suppliers 
who follow sustainable practices, for example, have ISO accreditation or those uh, suppliers are uh, able to source from, you know, protected from, from the chemicals and not, uh, you know, um, poorly sourced, for example, uh, to ensure that we have a robust supply chain management and ensure transparency and traceability. And that will uh, assist with your marketing campaign, right? So you can tell your uh, customers that, look, this is an entirely sustainable product. We, we're only, you know, uh, uh, providing our resources from farms or areas that, you know, do not have, um, do, or do not abuse children or do not have, you know, um, uh, sort of um, uh, in, uh, incorrect practices, farming practices. So for social inclusion and gender equality, um, we can do a gender order to the facility. We can Im implement inclusive policies. We can have good, robust uh, uh, policies in the department, in, in the um, company to talk about gender equality, diversity and inclusion um, with flexible working arrangements, you know, assisting, especially with females who may fall pregnant, offering them good packages in terms of maternity leave and paternity leave as well, providing training, capacity building, uh, focusing on gender equality, diversity awareness, um, engaging in community outreach, so partnering with local organizations and issues that support women empowerment, providing opportunities for employment and skill development uh, for women. And then finally, we must monitor and report on progress. So establishing good KPIs, key performance indicators, monitoring mechanisms to track progress towards sustainability goals and report on those to our uh, customers and our suppliers as well. And so by implementing these solutions, I believe our self-manufacturing company can enhance sustainable production practices, reduce environmental impact, promote social inclusivity, making a positive contributions to SDGs 12 and 5, and not only strengthen the company's reputation, but also attract environmentally conscious consumers and contribute to a more equitable society. So very interesting uh, case study, as I, I mentioned. Um, hopefully one day we'll all open a soap manufacturing company. It looks like a very profitable venture. Um, and so this is just a simple way of identifying, so just, let's just go back to the slide before, which was uh, this one, which we, find, we identified the SDGs that we want to uh, you know, choose. And then we go into identifying what is the strategies that we want to implement. And then we go into the solution building, finding solutions for each of those specific SDGs. So that's pretty much the process. And obviously monitoring and evaluation is critical so that you can report on that. Really fantastic low level in inverted commas uh, solution. And somebody on the group earlier posted about how can we resolve, I think it was uh, Zaytun that posted a question about, uh, you know, how can we, uh, are the targets too ambitious? What can we do to resolve them? And the point that you made much earlier in the beginning, it starts off with you, your neighbor, your, your street, your, your et cetera, et cetera, and it grows like that, right? So each one of us has a responsibility. And this is a, is a fantastic, like I said, low levelish example to demonstrate that something as simple as soap that we take for granted, hopefully someone uses every day, <laughs> uh, but, 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 but there's a solution in there uh, that can resolve, uh, that begins to resolve or tackle an issue related to one of the goals. A fantastic example. And Azir, let's move on to the next one and then we'll take some Q&A after this, if you don't mind, Azir. Yeah, sure. So just, I've got load sharing at eight o'clock, so I'm trying to reconnect. So I just, before we go to the next one, I just want to make sure I'm on my phone. Um, yeah, sure. No problem. No problem. Stopping over my Wi-Fi. <laughs> no problem. Everyone still there? Any comments, any waves, any thumbs up? Just to say that you're awake. I know some of the naughty students just put the camera on and then go in, uh, go for, go and watch a movie, Nazir. <laughs> I, I know a few of them that do that, yeah. So if you're around, yeah, okay, okay, I see one hand up. Thanks, David. He's the only one that's attending. Everyone else is sleeping. Ah, okay, um, a few more. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Nazir, tell me when you're ready. Right. Yeah, that should work now. Let's hope. Okay, okay. But if you don't, and if you, for whatever reason, disconnect, I'll keep them entertained yeah. while you reconnect, right? All right, perfect. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. So the second one we have is, again, a company that you own, a phone manufacturing company, um, and you want to promote responsible consumption and climate action. So that's some of your ideas that you have. That's the problem statement. 
is that you want to find ways ensuring that you know everyone's got a phone in their hand what happens to it electronic waste is a huge issue um where does it go to what happens after that are there ways that i can ensure that what's inside and a lot of these phones have some really interesting uh, minerals like gold and silver and many other parts that can be actually uh, recovered and then how and what impact am i having on on the climate and so uh you recognize that we need to align our operations with the SDGs and minimize our impact and contribute to a better future. And then I thought about so many SDGs. So the first thing you look at what they, so firstly, you can look at SDG four, which is quality education, right? The second is decent work and economic growth, uh, industry innovation and infrastructure, uh, SDG nine. Uh, responsible consumption and production, obviously, and climate action are the two. So when I speak about quality education, we can look at uh, opportunities that can that can actually assist in ensuring that, uh, uh, firstly, those who work for us or potentially those who would want to join the company are able and provided with this education. So it could be from a from a CSI project that we work with a school or a tertiary ed education company that we say, fine, we will sponsor 100 students, 10 students, five students, and show that education and will offer them internships when they do finish their tertiary education to join us or when they do finish their matric, they can potentially work for the company. Um, decent work and economic growth, again, that we spoke about earlier, industry innovation infrastructure, this is critical. So this is, you know, you thinking about what potential ways can the company use um, uh, in our design of the phone, so that becomes more sustainable. I know some of the projects, like for example, Samsung had an idea. I think now everyone's doing that. They don't provide you the, the charger cord or the charger plug anymore. That's one of the sustainable ways of saying, uh, you know, I don't know how that is for them a, a sustainable um, uh, idea that they won't provide that anymore. And you will still go purchase it to charge your phone. Um, uh, so again, it's just for them that the packaging becomes a bit smaller and that's saving the environment some way. But look, potentially someone that's selling a million phones, 10 million phones, uh, a small change can make a big difference, as I, as I always say. Um, and so we'll just move on then after we've figured out what SDGs that we can talk about. Uh, key questions that we need to ask ourselves. How can we reduce the ecological footprint of our manufacturing process, uh, including the extraction of um, raw materials, energy consumption, waste generating. What strategies can be implemented to minimize the use of hazardous materials and adopt environmentally friendly alternatives? How can we optimize and design the manufacturing process to extend the product lifespan? So that's reducing e-waste and encourage responsible consumption. What measures can be taken to en enhance energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gases? How can we collaborate with suppliers to ensure they align with sustainability goals? What strategies can be meant to engage and educate consumers about the importance of responsible phone consumption and encourage them to make sustainable choices? How can we develop a comprehensive framework for monitoring and measuring these? And by addressing these questions, we aim to develop a roadmap that outlines actionable steps and policies to ensure our phone manufacturing processes, ensuring responsible consumption and contributing to global uh, climate action. So, to address the problem, um, we need to have some solutions. The first thing, again, like the other one, was to have a sustainable assessment, a look at where our uh, sources of potential risks are, um, where can we find, you know, looking at the product life cycle, can we put potentially institute a, a, a system where there's a circular economy involved, where, where once the product reaches a certain time frame, you can go drop it off at an area that would recycle it. And there we will sponsor that facility. Maybe it's a small to medium enterprise. We will provide them with, with some stipends uh, to assist them uh, in ensuring that they're able to feed back to us. And that's the same material that we can then use in the new phone that we create. So that is one way we can look at um, you know, that product life cycle. So supply chain, we talk about who's supplying us, where are they promoting fair label practices? Um, you know, are they eco-friendly themselves? Uh, in terms of the design of the product, in terms of its durability, repairability, uh, recyclability, um, you know, looking at potential repairs and upgrades. Now, obviously a, a, a company wants to make profit and the profit may be bigger when people are buying new phones than rather buying used phones or spares 
uh, it may be more profitable. But again, you have to look at how are you reducing e-waste because somebody has a phone today, you're coming up with the um, a phone to, uh, today and then tomorrow you've got a new phone, uh, you know, or the next year it's a new uh, uh, phone. Again, what happens to that phone? What happens? So, so that's something you need to consider. In energy efficiency, uh, looking at including uh, potentially you know, phones that may have, uh, uh, or not the phone, rather, the, the facility the way the phones are being manufactured um, using solar, wind power um, to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Waste reduction, we spoke about this to minimize the amount of waste that's being generated. Uh, partnership with recycling companies that maybe they'll have drop-off points at areas uh, closer to people because people are lazy, right? The issue of recycling that I've always dealt with is there may be opportunities to recycle, but people are not going to change the habit of recycling if it's not easy to do. So, you know, we, we, in KZN, we used to get dropped off these orange bags that would be thrown outside your door. And it was so helpful because then you could actually ensure that your paper and plastic is going down there and it's not being um, uh, thrown away uh, into the normal regular bin. So because it was so easy, you could do it at home. And that's kind of the thing what you want, right? So consumer education, launching awareness campaigns, informing consumers about responsible phone use and recycling and product lifespan and so on like that. Trading initiatives, you can trade in your phone rather with us, we'll have the phone, we'll do something with it rather than throwing it away. Establishing sustainable metrics and reporting. So developing a comprehensive framework of monitoring and reporting on these. Uh, continue, continuous improvement innovation. So finding the best people for the job who are able to, especially younger people, who are able to then provide better solutions, better ideas, green technologies uh, coming up because they are the main users of the phone, you know, having that kind of information. So the phone manufacturer companies can reduce its environmental impact, promote responsible consumption, align with the SDGs, and this approach will help the company's reputation and attract uh, environmental conscious people. Yeah, so that's pretty much the second case study that I had, um, thought of, and I think it's quite clear on, on ways that we can all work together uh, to ensure that we think differently, that when we are in the working environment, we're going to our managers and coming up with solutions and, and hopefully working together. And I'm going to talk about that in my last two slides. So I've got a whole lot of resources and tools that you can use um, to better understand Okay, I think uh, Nazir is doing a switch over. It's eight o'clock on his side, well, eight o'clock in South Africa. Um, so if the rest of you can just hang on for a minute or two. But uh, again, if you just look at the example that uh, Nazir gave in terms of the phone, something practical, uh, it's the small uh, nudges that will ultimately make the big, or how do they say, the small ripples that make the big wave. Uh, and so how do we begin to make the ripples? I think too often uh, we want to make huge changes. And I think sometimes it's very possible, but given who we are as individuals, given who we are as, uh, did we lose everyone else? Is everyone else with me? Just trying to get an indication. Um, Few more people are falling out here. I think there's a few people falling out here. Just give me a second. Thanks, uh, thanks, Nkosanati. I think people that are affected by load shedding are, prob are probably the ones that are falling uh, falling by the wayside. I see the um, webinar organizer, also based in Durban, has fallen out. So let's give them a minute or two, and then we'll try and reconnect. I'm going to try and call them in the meantime as well. Does anyone want to make a comment? I can open up your mic for a minute. Does anyone want to just comment on anything that they've heard? Just maybe raise your hand, uh, then I'll, I'll, allow, uh, I'll give you access to the mic. You can say a few words. Does anyone want to say anything? No? OK.
Flight Indica. Um, good evening, Prof, good and good evening, evening to everyone. Um, evening. What I'd like to find out is that um, I believe we can choose one of the case study that was presented. And then the closing uh, date to submit, is it Friday, the coming Friday, or is it next week, Friday? I think it's, I think it's next Friday, the 21st, so you need to submit your, you need to submit by the 21st. Okay. Uh, but I just want to correct you on the first part. Ideally, you don't want to choose the two case studies that he's given, so uh, think of your own, but the, if, if you really have to, and you, if you like his example, then maybe elaborate on that one, right? All right. Okay. Uh, but 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 uh, you, you don't want to necessarily uh, steal his idea, right? Uh, right. The, the purpose of the case study was just to give you an example okay. of All right. people that can be done. You know, we don't have to we don't have to feed a million people, as yes. an example, right? How small do we start, and can many of us do that and have an impact on on on, on it? Right? So again, feeding is a bad example. But when you go through the when you go through the the 17 SDGs, you'll, you'll find one or two that link. What I liked about his two examples that he didn't stick to one SDG, right? He yes. sort of linked it to two or three of them. And I think that may be the key. So while somebody may just put one SDG and there's nothing wrong with that, if mm -hmm. you are able to demonstrate the link between two or three SDGs, that would be, I think, even better. But I'm not yes. setting the rules. I don't set the rules for the competition. I'm just sort of giving you advice, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Malfardin, you come through. Uh, come through, Malfardin. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. I wanted to find out, uh, so uh, our presentations that we, we have to make, or not that we have to make, but that we want to do, can we look at presentations from the net or do we have to necessarily just think about it ourselves? Because I feel it would be much more broader if we can, like how you say, interlink them, but using the net and then basically putting it into our own words and simplifying it to what we <laughs> want to do. Yeah. In, 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 at the region and like most academic institution, they will call that cribbing, right? <laughs> okay. I, I think really the idea is to be original, uh, Maud Fardin. Uh, and yes, while you can look at the net and look for ideas and look for inspiration, to take somebody else's idea and rehash it in terms of words is not your work. That's not original, right? Okay. So, so I, I think try and be original. Uh, incidentally, the 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 the, 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 the uh, experts who are reading the, the the people who are reading your proposition are experts in the field. Okay. And I'm sure they would have picked up. If you know somebody else did it, so type of a thing. So try and be as original as you can, uh, Fardin, Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in Kosenati, you want to come through? In Kosenati, you can unmute and come through. We can hear you try. Yeah, we can hear you speak a little louder. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm also experiencing load shedding till 10 p.m. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, very uh, fruitful and informative presentation. Uh, I am a second year DBA uh, student. I'm focusing on the first IR. I work in the training space within ICT and telecoms. Um, so I was happy to see what the actual SDGs are because one always hears about them, but it is the first time actually seeing what all 17 are, uh, and I liked what he mentioned about data analytics and all of that. I know there are provinces that are saying using data to fight crimes, and I think that can be spread throughout the country. Um, I have been seeing uh, paper takeaway containers, uh, paper straws, and um, plastic uh, uh, paper, um, um, wooden um, uh, teaspoons in this and it helps. And I think if the uh, government can try to subsidize retailers around uh, paper bags rather than plastics, because when we started buying plastics uh, a few years ago, I think people just made us switch to buying it instead of saying, let's rather use paper uh, bags. And I wanted to suggest maybe uh, the UN can look at countries that are uh, addressing these 
and use some incentive system like a grant for those uh, countries to do more. And lastly, um, you, you have countries like us that have apparently coal reserves of about 200 years, but we can't use that much coal without creating more problems for ourselves. So Correct. it would be nice to see how the UN will look at giving grants rather than loans for developing countries to start implementing um, some of these greener forms of energy. But uh, sure. awesome uh, presentation by the speaker. And uh, yeah, awesome. Thank you for the second part. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Very much. Uh, Nazir, welcome back. I, I just took a few questions while you were off, off air. And I, I don't know, Nazir, are you back? Uh, have you unmuted yourself, Nazir? Uh, yeah, oh, can you hear me now? Okay, we can hear you now, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we just took a few comments while you were off air. Uh, yeah. Some interesting questions that came through. Uh, one or two people wanted to copy your, 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 your presentation. And I said to them, it is it is copyrighted, so they can't use that example, right? Because I'm sure yeah. you want to win the Harvard trip as much as they do. Yeah, uh, yeah. But 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 the important thing is, it's something every day that we we can face. So sometimes we look we look for huge solutions, and that's what sort of paralyzes us. And sometimes it's just in front of us. And if many of us do those things that are just in front of us, we will have that ultimate impact that we want. We're trying to achieve, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's that's exactly the point. Sorry, my, my video is not on because it's, it's just not worry. allowing me to. So, yeah. Don't worry. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's kind of the idea what I wanted to share. I mean, it, it may have been something that seems so simple, but once you start getting into it, I mean, I could have wrote written thesis on just one of these topics, you know, because there's so much into it and there's so much overlap, but at the same time, there's so much opportunity that I always see. Um, and so, so finding that, I mean, this is this is a time for young students who minds are, are so active compared to ours, so much more opportunity than I had in my days at university. So um, again, this, the, using these SDGs and using the resources we have, and you don't have to be an environmentalist, you don't have to be an economist. You, you this is this is so beautifully uh, uh, matched together that whether you're an economist, whether you're an environmentalist, you can still understand how to integrate these various um, SDGs. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I'm going to try and answer one or two questions that uh, in the chat, and then we'll we'll. we'll uh, Nazir, how much more time you need to sort of conclude your last two slides? Uh, no, I mean the last slide was just talking very general in, in getting involved in SDGs, so it wasn't really anything major. It's like a minute or so. Okay, uh, let's make, I can just let's go through that. quickly now. Yeah, let's do that. Please yeah. Let's I mean, pretty much. Uh, yeah, but the, again, I don't think the slide's working. Um, just try. Um, no, yeah, it's saying host disabled participants screen share. Um, and our host is back. Uh, is our host it's it's back okay. Here. I can just walk. I can just talk through it. It's not a problem. Yeah, but our, a host, our host is back. So let me just, while you talk through it, let me try and see if the host can enable you. Um, Israel, can you yeah. try and uh, can you try and yeah, yeah he's back. Israel, just uh, just uh, re, uh, uh, allow Nazir to share, please. Okay, does he try and read it anyway? Does he read without without the slide in the meantime? Oh yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah, so I was sharing the various resources that you could go uh, to. Uh, but the last slide was just talking about getting involved in SDG. So uh, many people ask, well, you know, how does it relate to my actual life? that I'm living, even if I'm not a student, I'm just somebody. The idea is that there's ways that we can implement practices in our own life, making conscious decisions and choices in our lifestyles uh, that align with the SDGs. So, you know, choosing products that have uh, a better, a higher sustainability rating, um, choosing products forgive that, me. you know, have forgive potentially... Me. Yeah, Nazir, forgive me. I, I yeah. think you can share now. It may just be better visual and to see if you can share your slide. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think it makes it makes it easier to watch a static radio, right? Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. carry on. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing is obviously educate yourselves, learn about SDGs as you're doing right now, uh, raising awareness. You know, events, workshops, campaigns like what you're doing again today. Uh, having a little club, you know, with people that are of concern similar to you, um, to develop yourself, engaging in community volunteer work uh, relating to SDGs. Uh, with local organizations for pov poverty relation, education, environmental conservation, collaborating again with you know other uh, students, 
Um, and then again, I was talking about was implementing practices yourself, you know, trying to change. I challenge myself every month to try and open it, try recycling something new. Normally I've done plastics and papers and so on like that. I try now with electronic waste. If I'm throwing something away, which I normally would, I'd go and find an, ele- ele- they call it an electronic cemetery rather. So you go there and they try and pull out pieces and people have, have actually made money from just normal, you know, scrap that you would normally find. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways I challenge myself using technology, social media, you know, lever- leveraging uh, platforms that students have to engage in these matches, um, you know, participation in competitions and challenges like what we're doing here at, at, um, at Regent. And so the idea is even small actions can have a great major impact. Start with what you're passionate about and take those steps forward to create a, a sustainable and equitable world. And that was the end, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm afraid to open up for questions and answers for, for, for questions. So I just want to go through one or two comments. Firstly, in the, in the comments in the chat bar. So there's somebody asks here: Do we have to write in any specific format or structure? And maybe Nazir, I just ask you to share your first case study. Uh, I, I like the format of that. So this is just a guide. This is not a template. Okay. Or should I put it the other way? This yeah. is a template yeah. about the guide. Oh, no, it's a guide. So you just open up your first case study where you define the problem. So it's your typical sort of academic way of presenting, uh, you, you know, what you're trying to solve, right? So just go there at problem statement, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Go, just open up the three, yeah? There's one more. Yeah. So as you can see there, you, you, need, a, you need to identify in a very bold, right on the top, you need to identify... Uh, what you're trying to solve and then identify a problem statement. So use the, exactly those words, call it problem statement. And then you will define your problem statement for what you're trying to, re- what, what you're trying to solve. Okay. Then next one, again, as Nazir has done it very nicely and you can maybe make it a little bit longer if you want to give somebody some context. What is the background? What is the context of the problem that you're trying to solve? Then, uh, again, what Nazir has done, if you can identify, and, and this, is, this is not a hard and fast rule, if you want to just solve one SDG and you think it's just the one thing that you want to resolve, then you'll say SDG 5 and what it is. But in Nazir's case, as you can see, he's got five issues, five SDGs that he claims integrate to resolve this problem or to solve this issue. Go to the next one, Nazir. Next page. Right. Then it's just the example there of uh, how he, how he hopes to do it. Yeah. And so basically, in I suppose a page, a page and a half, two pages, or two PowerPoint slides, or three PowerPoint slides, whatever you think you are comfortable in, write it in very neat handwriting if you want to, but identify the issue that you want to solve link it back to one of the 17 or multiple of the 17 SDGs and demonstrate how by doing what you think can be done, you are addressing multiple SDGs in solving this problem. In this case, uh, a, a new soap or new soap packaging, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as it is another page after this, it's just two pages for case study one, am I right? Uh, no, no. Then there's the this is the final one, which talks about the actual solutions. The actual solution, right? Yeah. So the way Nazir has done it, I think it's fantastic. Uh, my my only suggestion is if you do it in 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 some sort of format, because he's using PowerPoint, the 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 font sizes changes in terms of in relation to how much text you have on a page. But if you are writing it out in in Word. Uh, or in a, in a word processing document, or uh, it, it may be easier than the text size is consistent uh, throughout uh, uh, throughout the three or four or five pages that you're going to use. And yeah. the, the, the nature of the competition isn't to write a thesis or an assignment of 5,000 words. Uh, I know that some of our students, uh, Nazir, we've really trained our students at MB, at, at, at Regent. <laughs> Yeah, right, we, right. We, we can't restrict them in the exams also. They, they, they love to write lengthy, uh, res- <laughs> lengthy answers for the exams. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 yeah, just bear in mind there's potentially hundreds of students that are, uh, that are going to be 
submitting uh, entries from the entire honoris network. In the honoris network, that means all the universities that are part of the honoris uh, network, there's about 70 odd thousand students. So even if 10% of the students enter the competition, uh, you'll be looking at 7,000 entries. So someone on the other side doesn't have the luxury of reading 300 pages. Try and keep it as nicely as Nazir did. I would say three to five PowerPoint slides or three or four pages, A4 pages with very clear headings, very clear description. What's the problem? What SDG? How is it going to solve it? What is it going to solve? And I think you, you will stand a good chance uh, then to, 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 to participate in a competition, right? Uh, let me go to the next one. Yeah, Rizal, I just want to add, Carry I just on. want to add something here. Yeah. See, one of the comments was our presentation, could it be on any organization or business? I mean, it doesn't even need to be, uh, I'm sure, an organization or business, right? It could be in your community, you see a problem. Right. You see an issue in your neighborhood with, you know, young, young people without jobs and you come up with a solution how you can design that. You know, so it, again, it doesn't have to be a business anything. Yeah. 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 Uh, last one is I understand that the prize is winning a trip to Harvard, but if there are other ideas that have potential, is there any support that can be provided in terms of making these ideas into reality? If so, is there a cap in terms of how many ideas? Submit as many ideas as you want, uh, Luto. Is it uh, Luto? Uh, submit as many ideas as you want. I'm not sure what the entry competition is, but let's assume that you are restricted to one entry in the in the honoris competition. I'm very happy, uh, and I'm going to share my email address. Uh, uh, with everyone. Uh, I'll be very happy after the competition, uh, 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 that means after next week, Friday, you give me your additional ideas with the, with the hope that it can be scaled up or it could be realized. And we have a unit within region called the Red Hub, Region Enterprise Development Hub, that looks at helping people scale up businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll be very happy to explore uh, an opportunity for you at that level, uh, Luto. Uh, um, if I pronounce your name correctly, but uh, yeah, that that goes to anyone uh, that goes to anyone that is part of this that's part of this uh, presentation this evening. Uh, this, can I just quickly pass by a quick example, right? Um, you want to just talk through very very quickly about the circular economy, uh, Nazir, in particular in relation to the fashion industry, just as an example, if I may, Nazir. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I, I did mention the circular economy a few times, uh, and I, I maybe I'm not, I'm not explained it too much. Um, but basically, when we look at the circular economy, we look at this cradle to grave uh, concept um, of closing this loop that is being created from the time a product is developed to the time it reaches its uh, end or its grave, and finding methods within that loop. Um, and potential opportunities within that loop to, to bring it back to a raw material and creating new products, new ideas, and new innovations through it. So it's just this kind of habitual change that needs to be this nature uh, in itself um, to ensure that we maximize the resources that we have um, in ensuring that we can through Without this this. chain that it moves through from some door, and then when it's disposed of, we're then closing that loop and finding opportunities to to re to reignite. Yeah, so that's kind of pretty much the the, the idea behind it. So it's like giving waste a new life. It's finding opportunities in 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 all the scales. So instead of that water that you're throwing away, it may go into somebody else's production. Maybe a neighboring property wants to use that water that you would normally throw into sewer. Would say, listen, I actually want to use it for irrigation. You know, potentially. So, have, finding those opportunities away and reducing your environmental impact uh, along that way. Correct. And and recycling in, is one way of doing it, but there's other yeah. terms that are associated with it, like for example, repurposing or upcycling. These are all terms that have sort of become uh, well in, in in recent years have become a lot more common. So, 
as opposed to recycling, uh, there's other ways that you can do, for example, with clothing, your, your, your jeans doesn't have to be, uh, your jeans doesn't have to go to your, your sibling, it doesn't have to go to a charity shop. It could be used in another way. You could make a bag with it. You could, I've seen people using it for planting of plants. And as I don't know if you've seen those as well. So, yes, so there's yes, other yes. uses of it uh, in the lifespan of the jeans the day after you outgrow it in terms of size. So uh, again, it, it's how you use it in your in your example. Ladies and gentlemen, we have about five or seven minutes left. I'm going to try and conclude. Uh, thank you, Nazir, very much. Uh, I, I'm going to try and share my screen, but please stay on for the next few minutes, Nazir. Sure. Yeah, I'm going to see how do you share, Nazir, if you can un... Okay, I'm going to try yeah, and There's find a little my... green button at the bottom. Yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to find where's my... Do you see it on your, on your screen? Oh, that's right, yeah. I'm just trying to see where my screen is firstly. Uh, I'm looking for this one. Okay. Okay. Uh, can people see anything? Can you scan? Can I, I, have I stopped? Stop sharing? Okay. Yeah. Is it this one? No. Is it this one? No. Is it this one? There is it. Okay. Yeah, we see your entire. We see your entire screen. <laughs> Can you see my see screen now? Yeah. Right. All right. So, guys, this is an unnecessarily complicated but an extremely useful tool. Uh, it's called the business model canvas. Uh, you need, ideally, you need another two hour session to walk you through this. Uh, I'm not going to spend the two hours doing it simply because everyone that registered would have received this in the link that we sent them. So in the invite link that we sent you, you would have received two links. One to the SDGs, uh, the, the UN platform for the SDGs with a lot more detailed explanation that Nazir had given. He had very succinctly uh, summarized it for us. And the second link was this particular, what they call the business model canvas. It's not a requirement, but it's a useful tool to use for you to be able to Put forward a good case for your uh, uh, for your for your problem that you're trying to solve. I prefer if you kept it simpler, the way Nazir had kept it. But if you follow this, like I said, you probably need another two-hour session, if at all, um, if more, uh, to, to get you through understanding what all these diff blockies mean. But when it is filled out correctly. It becomes a good foundation to make a good case for your uh, value proposition. Uh, so it may be worth learning this anyway, irrespective of, of, uh, of, of whether you're going to use it in this exercise or not. Okay. And then I'm happy to open up to one or two more questions. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for the comments. Um, right. I'm happy to take one or two more comments. If anyone's got some, uh, I'm gonna. I've got two minutes. Let's close up with a, one or two comments. Uh, or if you want to speak on, the, if you want to, yeah, if you want to speak, just lift your hand and I'll unmute your mic. Okay, let's conclude with that. Uh, Israel, do we have a do we have a uh, a, a survey that we've created uh, for this uh, for this webinar? I'm just trying to get an indication whether the 35 plus people that participated. Uh, thank you, in Kosanati. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Pule. Thanks for your comments. Uh, Anna, I think uh, the, when you log on to the site, uh, the, the the link for the competition. If it's not given, we'll probably give it to you in the next day or two. Uh, so that will indicate to you how many entries you can make. Uh, but yes, prepare more than one. But if, if at worst they allow you to enter only one, then uh, talk to us. We'll see what we can do, right? Uh, Odua, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Nazira, to you, a compliment as well to you. Thank you very much for a job well done. And we'll try and conclude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Thanks for the opportunity and all the best to uh, all the students and good luck. Yeah, let me just read a few more. Closing date, 
is uh, for registering is for today. Sorry, if the question has been already. No, the closing date for the competition is the 21st. Uh, all of you, when you get the link back for this video, we'll also indicate there the link for where to enter the competition. Right? Thanks, uh, Pule. Nazir says thanks. Uh, Mabuse, great guidance from the presenter. Thanks, Nazir. I think you did an excellent job. Uh, as you can see, Nazir's vast experience in the field uh, really helped, and I think that's that's what we what we should all aim for, right? Become the master of your profession, so that I get you to be a presenter in the future, and you can lead. You can lead. Thank you, Victor. Thanks for that uh, comments to for Nazir as well. Uh, Nazir, we just made you a professor as well. So fantastic to you, Nazir. You can pick up your your, your professor cap with us tomorrow. <laughs> one day, one day. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Auxilla, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Stay blessed, everyone.